Good evening, gospel revolutionaries around this whole world. You're still here. <laughs> Uh, I hope you had a great eclipse day. If you got to be in the, um, uh, the, the full eclipse, uh, goodness gracious, I drove up to my daughter's house and it was just she and I, and we had a wonderful time and uh, we had our, had our glasses on and she was laying out, I got her a blanket and was laying out on the concrete with a pillow and uh, I was sitting in a uh, little picnic chair, you know, uh, one of those canvas ones, and I was all laid back. She got pictures of me, and her, uh, we'll post them uh, for you. Uh, they're really quite hilarious. One, I was had my mouth hanging over. I said, you have to take that picture again. <laughs> I'm not, not going to send that picture out with me with my mouth hanging open like that. I'm very, very vain. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yes, we made it. And, uh, the evening, uh, yesterday evening, uh, I was able to make it back in time and some really wonderful friends of mine from Florida, uh, the, um, entire Pratt family met me, uh, at uh, one of our restaurants here in Clarksville over on the Cumberland River. And uh, Owen had one of his friends from L.A. that was with him. He was kind of a gym trainer and also a uh, Christian guy. And uh, Owen, you could tell, was just kind of chomping at the bit for me to share some gospel. So I got led, asked some leading questions in front of him by his mom. And uh, uh, his dad's just a real sweetheart. And his brother also was there. And um, I'm sorry, my computer's coming apart right here in front of me. <laughs> uh, things are changing around the gospel revolution, but sometimes we have to wait a little while. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, uh, and to mention that, also the pledge drive, we're going to be tallying all that up and letting you know. This looks like it's going to be a very successful pledge drive. Thank you guys so very much. Uh, back to the story. Um, so, uh, this subject came up and I was thinking, you know, uh, when Owen started asking some leading questions, uh, which he is, uh, very apt to do, um, uh, I was wondering what to actually share. And usually what's on my mind is what's going to come out of my mouth. So, uh, the, I would do. I wouldn't do any good running a Bible school, running programs, and doing teachings, and because I've got to pick up where I left off. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, I started sharing about this issue of being the light of the world, and uh, so this uh, gentleman, uh, his name was Sean, very very wonderful uh, man. Uh, I really enjoyed his company and. Uh, he was sharing uh, uh, with me a little bit about himself, but um, when I was uh, sharing with them about the light of the world, uh, I've been in, set and taught the Bible in front of Owen and uh, Lauren and the, their mother, the father. I've uh, He and I have had some conversations. He's a really wonderful human being. Anyway, uh, so I started sharing on this thing that you and I've gotten into about being the light of the world. And, you know, there, there's the issue of creation. So, uh, I, I, we're still getting questions as to clarification of this, but everybody's very excited about this. And so I shared this with them and told them, uh, was sharing about how that God said, let there be light. And of course, John's statements, how the light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. And also Paul's teaching now that we were created in Christ Jesus before the foundations of the world. And the only event of creation that happened before the foundations of the world based on those Hebrew terms and also in the Greek in the New Testament uh, that, uh, uh, like we've told you, that doesn't mean any time within eons before, but it actually happened when God said, let there be light. 
because that's when that light shineth in the darkness, according to John chapter one, uh, which gives us great insight. One of the reasons that we can uh, use the book of John uh, is that we've been able to, uh, uh, to see that the writer of this incredible book, this incredible letter uh, and testament of John is not the guy who wrote first and second and uh, third John. This, I think, also is the John who wrote the Revelation. There were a lot of Johns back then, so it's quite a bit to uh, try to wade through and look at objectively. However, you can't read the book of John and say that first, second, and third John was written by the same man. This man understood the, uh, the uh, undertakings of the work of Christ, and the one in first, second, third John, <laughs> ah, thanks for playing, he just did not. So I started sharing about this and uh, the uh, power of when God said, let there be light, what all that encompassed, it actually encompassed all of creation. Uh, it was like the end of the work was spoken uh, in the statement, let there be light. All things were created by him and without him, that was not anything made that was made. That's John again. And uh, he is referring back to this moment in time when God said, let there be light. In fact, that's the first time time ever existed is when God said that. So before that, there was no time. Uh, you had to have uh, light to have time. And there began the measurement of days and things like that, even though the sun and the moon and the stars were not created till later. That's going to take some thinking through even more. But with what little we know, uh, we can uh, uh, discern uh, this much. Uh, that is that when Jesus said, uh, it is finished, that indeed that was the moment it was absolutely culminated. But wouldn't you know it, God finished it before it started. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and to be honest with you, only God can finish something before he starts it. <laughs> There's nobody else who can do that. So, uh, but as I was talking to Al today and he said, was saying, yes, but we had to go through that process. And that's very true. And I was glad he made that point. The process had to be gone through. Possibly one of the reasons uh, among all, number one, it was predestined that way by God, and we don't argue with the predestination of God. We also do not accept predestination at all after the cross because nothing needs to be predestined. In fact, you can't be free if you're predestined, right? Because somebody else is in charge. It's just a very simple equation. So, uh, but everything was predestined before the cross, and uh, so when God said, let there be light, there, there's this statement that is made that uh, John tells us here that the light shone in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So uh, it looks as though the basis of understanding why the process, I think that's a big question for uh, all of us is why the process? Uh, many people have asked, it doesn't make any difference what doctrine that somebody believes in. Yes, you believe a doctrine. It's not the big nasty word. Uh, it just means teaching. <laughs> People get hung up on uh, the slightest things. We thought we were completely free in the word of faith moment because we didn't use um, uh, velvet bags or uh, little plates with velvet in the bottom of them to take up the offering. We were free. We used Kentucky Fried Chicken Buckets. <laughs> So it's really funny what we will accept as freedom in place of a real thing. There's a real thing called freedom. And if your life is predestined and planned by God or your mom or your, your aunt or your uncle or anybody else, if your life is, de uh, is being planned by somebody else and all, especially already known, you are not free. So don't give me the I'm free and I was predestined to be here thing. Eh, thanks for playing. I know that irritates people. I guess that's why I use it. <laughs> I'm I'm getting bad in my old age, and you guys are just going to have to tolerate me because that's the way it is with old people now. That's just how you got to do it. Uh, so <laughs> I've been waiting to get old for a long time. Uh, 
So what we're looking at here is that this entire process had to be comprehended. We had to be able to perceive the finished work uh, of Christ and that everything was created by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So this powerful comprehension is rooted in the Hebrew scriptures. You're not going to comprehend it is finished without going through the process that God took the entire human race through. Had somebody uh, point out to me the other day, I was talking to Vic and I really appreciated that Vic uh, bringing this up. He said, you know, he says, we're all the time talking about this wrathful, angry God. And he said, we almost say it as though that God was always angry and always wrathful. And I told him, I really appreciate you bringing that out because I hadn't stopped and thought about it. But the fact is, God was not always angry and always wrathful or always jealous, but he did get that way. And uh, so, uh, but you've got to even know that part of the process and the reasons for the anger and the reasons for the responses that he had, because it's in the resolution of that that we're able to understand when Jesus said, it is finished. Now, it is a bit of a mind blower to realize that that moment was finished before the foundation of the world. Uh, and then there was this whole thing where Jesus said, it is finished. Right? So we have from here to here. And, uh, but in the this incredible ability of God to finish something before he starts it is for us a learning experience. So don't get freaked out at how God laid out this learning experience for us. And yes, it was absolutely necessary for Jesus to die on the cross. Yes, he was born of a virgin. Yes, Jesus uh, then took Adam to the death on the cross. Uh, that That's just the story. See, if the story isn't true, then the creation itself is not real. It's not even true. And I do have friends that say none of this is real. So uh, I talk to a lot of people that have a lot of uh, insights and things that they believe, but I'm okay with everybody's beliefs. Sometimes when I'm teaching the gospel, people think I'm intolerant, uh, but I'm not. I'm such a nice guy, uh, but I'm not intolerant. I can sit and listen to somebody blah, blah about their beliefs and not respond at all and just be a nice, happy attendant. Uh uh, because I'm not bothered by people's beliefs because it doesn't change the truth. And they could change my mind by uh, introducing some beliefs, so I just listen. But I'm not angry at those beliefs. I'm angry at what some of those beliefs can do to harm people uh, and to interrupt their ability to comprehend the light. And uh, Paul spoke to us in Ephesians chapter three, and he said that, it was important that we would be able to comprehend uh, with everyone, and that term also is translated perceived as in some uh, other um, uh, translations. That word comprehend is a little tricky. You guys that want to get into that as a word study, uh, it's, it really is uh, interesting. And when it says comprehend, uh, comprehended it not, uh, that's very interesting. But what we're doing now is just taking what we understand of that. And this part is definitely a part of this understanding, but I think there's more to it. So uh, Paul said that it was important that we would be able to comprehend the heights, the depths, the breadths, uh, all of the dimensions of the love of God. So the ability to comprehend is what the process is there for. It's for comprehension. Uh, it is a total uh, mind boggle sometimes to realize that God predestined all of, uh, all of that before the cross. Uh, and people ask, why didn't he just do it from the beginning? 
there's something important about what God made us to be that it's important for us to, to operate this. We need our operating system up and operating. And somehow the truth of the Hebrew scriptures is a part of a download that needs to be done for this to have a good operating system going in it when you are trying to perceive truth. And I think that truth helps everyone on every level, whether you're a doctor or lawyer or Indian chief, as they used to say when I was growing up. <laughs> but uh, regardless, it is the ability to comprehend. Now, how do we comprehend light? Well, the, the fact that it is a comprehension issue is the fact that would tend to tell us that it's not, this light doesn't have physical properties. Uh, so, uh, I was sharing some about this with my friends, as I said, as I was sitting there on the Cumberland river at, uh, the, uh, Liberty, um, uh, Liberty, you'll have to look it up. Liberty something grill on the Cumberland river in Clarksville, Liberty park. I'm sorry. I got it. Not that old yet. <laughs> uh, Liberty park. And uh, it's just really a great place to be able to go here in Clarksville. We don't have a whole lot of uh, really nice places as far as restaurants are concerned. So uh, the as we sat there and talked and I was sharing this issue about us being created, that what we are, this I can say very confidently that what we are was created on day one. Does that mean that we were created on day one? Well, man himself was not created until God picked up the red clay, picked up, that's the word Adam means red clay. And until God picked up the dirt and started forming it into a man. And, uh, but the fact of it is we are the light of the world. So there is a comprehension here that before God even began making man, he finished man on the first day, which was the light of the world. And that's also Christ, because uh, Paul makes the statement of how that, uh, that we were created in Christ before the foundations of the world, and that is at the point of let there be light, the best I can surmise at this point. So uh, as I was sharing, I uh, was trying to make a little joke and uh, uh, the uh, this gentleman that was there uh, with Owen from uh, LA, he said, you know, and I don't think in these terms, but I was, I, I was it showed me that he felt slumped, that this was a very important moment for him. He said, you know, he said, uh, I think, that uh, flying from L.A. to Nashville, spending two days there, driving up there, it took us five hours to do a two-hour drive to get back out of all of that mayhem. And uh, But he said, you know, he said, I think that the entire thing uh, was absolutely so that I could meet you. What he meant was so he could hear the gospel. Because so many Christians have these thoughts in them and they've just never been able to express them. And he happened to be one of those. So he began to comprehend, if you will. And I told him, I told the guys at the table, I said, you know what? We just may become first day Adventist. How about that? Try that on for style. We are not gonna become seventh day Adventist. The Sabbath was fulfilled. Jesus died on the sixth day. That's the sixth day is when man was created. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day, the day that we came into existence as light before we were ever formed out of the dust of the earth. You want to be a first day Adventist? <laughs> Uh, I know somebody's going to start that, just like somebody started us being GRs. Who knows? But uh, folks, we love you. 
uh, enjoy the teaching, enjoy this time. And, uh, and again, I'm, I'm waiting for my pats on the back for being right once again. When you understand the truth, when it comes to the end of the world doctrines, I will be right every time, every single time.